Before we uh, get into today's subject, what I would like to do is just spend a, a quick little uh, jaunt back into yesterday's subject, which was Revelation chapter 12. There is um, an, an interpretation of Revelation chapter 12 that is um, really the Roman Catholic interpretation. In fact, there's many um, different stained glass windows you can find throughout Europe that will actually depict this, this idea. The Revelation 12 is the story of the Lord Jesus Christ conquering sin, that the woman is Mary, that the man-child is Christ himself, and that the devil is the devil, the, or the dragon is the devil, and that he basically would overcome this. Um, that's the one sort of interpretation. The other one is the, the Jehovah's Witness interpretation that, again, would see these things playing out many years prior when the Lord Jesus Christ pre-existed, and this is the situation where, of course, uh, Michael and his angels, which they believe is Christ, throughout the, the devil and his angels. Um, both these interpretations can really be answered very quickly. If we come to Revelation chapter 1, in verse 1, it just comes down to some basic, very simple, careful Bible reading. Revelation 1, verse 1, we read, it's the apocalypse, or the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, to show to his servants things which must shortly come to pass, and he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. So the thing we have to pick up right away is that what's contained within the apocalypse is those things that are shortly to come to pass. Both of those interpretations and all the different strains that would kind of follow that idea are talking about things that happened 6,000 years ago, if you take the Jehovah's Witness point of view, or the Roman Catholic one, it's at least, depending on how you would date it, between 90 and or 60 years prior to this, that the Lord Jesus Christ would have been um, certainly born of Mary and then ascending to heaven in A.D. 33, and so consequently that interpretation is completely and absolutely impossible because it's not things that are shortly to come to pass. And quite often, brethren and sisters, when we're dealing with the apocalypse, when we're dealing with the, the situation that's laid out for us, all we have to do is just step back for a moment and just spend a little bit of time looking at the context of what is said and we can find very quickly that some of these ideas that are sort of forced into the text to be interpreted by it um, are just not, not able to be held up. Um, anyway, that being the way it is, we'd like to move on to our, our class today, um, dealing with the subject, Drunk with the Blood of the Saints. And this, of course, is taken from Revelation chapter 17, if we just turn there for a moment, and at verse 6, where, um, or verse 5, we have the Apostle John who sees this apostasy really in its latter fulfillment, uh, its last stage of development, and we find he sees this woman here who is uh, riding the beast, and it says her, in her forehead, verse 5, was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, and the abomination of the earth, and he sees this woman in her latter day signification as being drunk with the blood of the saints and the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when he looks at her, he wonders with great admiration. And the important thing we want to pick out of that is that this is the characteristic that God describes this situation through in the book of Revelation to us. It's not something that's all historical in the past. This is the resume of the system. This is what it is guilty of, and this is what it will be judged for. Now, as we follow this development through, really it goes right the way back to the book of Genesis. We find that there is this enmity, of course, as we're very familiar with, back in Genesis chapter 3, in verse 15, where we read, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. And so the story of Revelation is just simply the playing out of that passage the seed of the woman versus the seed of the serpent, a temporary wound to be inflicted upon the seed of the woman and a permanent wound to be inflicted upon the seed of the serpent and upon the serpent himself eventually. And the character of this conflict is described for us in the letter of John the Apostle, the epistle of John, chapter 3. There he talks about the, uh, the, uh, those who would be after the order of Cain, 1 John chapter 3, in verse 12, he says, We are not to be as Cain, who was of the wicked one, and slew his brother. And why did he slay him? Wherefore slew he him? 
because his own works were evil and his brothers were righteous. And he goes on to say, Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hates you. And so that is the situation. The world, and specifically in this case, the apostasy, hates those who are followers of the truth because their deeds are righteous. And he says, and if Cain hated his brother and slew him for that reason, as he points out that they also did to the Lord Jesus Christ, who Christ himself says, he says, then don't be surprised if it also hates you. And that's the situation we have when we're dealing with this system. Now, when we consider the different passages that talk about this system, we find that they come up in Revelation chapter 12. Towards the end of the chapter, we have the persecution of the woman and a war that's made against the remnant of her seed. In chapter 13, verse 6, we have the next stage of the apocalypse, the beast of the sea making war with the saints. Chapter 17, verse 6, we find this harlot system drunk with the blood of the saints and the martyrs of Jesus. And, of course, it's paralleled in Daniel chapter 7 with the little horn who makes war with the saints and overcame them, as our brother Colin looked at in the last class. That's the, sort of the overall picture uh, is given to us in Daniel chapter 7, where he says, I beheld the same horn which comes out of that Roman Empire, made war with the saints and prevailed against them, and he shall speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High. And so that is the picture that's given, this little horn with these eyes and a mouth speaking great things. Interesting to note that there is no ears. There is no hearing that's going on. It's simply a speaking and a seeing that's going on. There's no listening to the word of God. There's no being taught. It simply is what comes out of its mouth and what it sees. And so, of course, it was during the time period of that uh, pagan Roman system when we begin... Uh, as we looked at yesterday, that the saints were first persecuted by um, the Roman emperors who were of the pagan stamp. We read in Revelation chapter 6, verse 9 to 10, how he saw the souls of uh, them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony that they held, and they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell upon the earth? And we cannot undermine, brethren and sisters, or under, sort of say, uh, underestimate, or I guess that's not really the word I'm looking for. We can't underplay this. This is a depiction of um, what would have happened. Here are the Christians awaiting, as is somewhat obscured here, the lions and the, the evil beasts that would come upon them. But around there are those that were burned at the stake, who basically were put upon poles with wood underneath them, and they would be ignited. And this happened in a place... Um, on the, during Nero's Rome called the Vatican, the Vatican Gardens. And it was in that spot that many of these martyrs were put to death. But it wasn't long, though, as we saw yesterday, until this system would be replaced. And it's interesting to note that as soon as the apostasy, as we looked at it yesterday, raised up itself by the hand of, of Constantine and would sit upon the, uh, the throne, really, it was showing themselves that they were God, it wouldn't be long before they would assume the role of the persecutor. Reading in the history of the Donatists, they were a group of believers in Africa, some of which probably held very close to the truth as we know it today, others of which would have had different strains. In the early age of Christianity, the persecution of Christians by pains and penalties was by the worshippers of false gods of the heathen. Different parties, he goes on, couldn't really uh, go to either one of those to really get any of their arguments settled. But no sooner was the emperor, the first emperor, who professed himself to be a Christian, seated on the throne, than there was an entire change in the business of persecution, so far as the subjects were concerned. Formerly, it was the heathen, or the pagans, persecuting the Christians, now it was the Christians persecuting their recusant brethren who were worshippers of the same God. So these are people out in the world who recognize that very soon after Constantine came to power, that the Christians now who went to power with him began to follow that character that we read about in the first epistle of John. Now they would persecute their brethren because their own deeds were evil, but their brethren's deeds were righteous. Constantine 
you see, had ridden to power by harnessing the Christian God as his champion. And he had supported the apostate church. And they had thrown their support behind him. In fact, it was Eusebius who would argue in his different dissertations that many of the Christians, of course, at one point in time, refused to, to raise arms. So Eusebius, as we will look at later on, decided, well, we need to sort of change the way things are seen here. The passage of my kingdom is not of this world, else would my servants fight, was changed. And the idea was, well, that was the Lord Jesus Christ back in A.D. 33. But this new age that's coming upon us now is the kingdom of God on earth. Therefore, it's okay now for Christians to fight. And so many of them joined behind Constantine. Well, the problem was is that once the Christian church rose to power with Constantine, the many dissenting factions that it contained became a problem for him. Constantine wanted a solid foundation to stand upon, not a crumbling rock of all divisions. He decided to solve this problem that he would remove all those who would bring dissension to his power base. And so what he began to do was crush any voices of dissent. Having by these means, this is Eusebius writing, describing his reign, banished dissension and reduced the church of God to a state of uniform harmony. He next proceeded to a different duty, feeling it incumbent on him to exp expirate uh, another sort of impious persons as pernicious enemies of the human race. He describes them as pests who were basically there uh, under special spe um, garb of religious decorum. And he goes on to say that he eventually banished all such offenders. So the way he dealt with dissension among the ecclesias that had become apostate, largely those that went out from us, he took them as a whole. And so if there was a little group over here who didn't believe the same thing that the Laodicean apostasy did that was now sort of in the heavens, then we have to get rid of this little group for fear that they might infect the others. And so it was that Constantine made an effort to keep stability in the empire by calling for a special council of his bishops. The goals of the meeting were to hammer out doctrinal differences and come up with one single doctrine that would be universal throughout the empire. And this meeting took place in 325 AD at a place called Nicaea. And it was there that the doctrine of the Trinity as one of the issues was hammered out. And uh, many of you have seen this before, but in the back there is Constantine, who incidentally is a pagan at this point in time still, not baptized, not even Christian by, by really definition of it. And uh, in the front here we have two men. This is Arius, who is basically arguing the Arian sort of stream of thought as far as the, uh, the nature of Christ goes. And this individual here is a man named Bishop Nicholas, and Bishop Nicholas, we know better as Saint Nicholas or Santa Claus. And he's actually involved in what is rather a heated debate here over this subject. And you can see he's got somewhat of a clenched fist down here because shortly after this scene that's been depicted here happens, he would turn around and give some Christmas cheer, I guess you could say, to Arius, <laughs> knocking him clean off his feet. And that's how they debated the doctrine of the Trinity. And you think about the words of James and of Jude about these wars and fightings among you. Well, here it was, consumed upon their lusts, looking for power in the power base. And so it was the infamous doctrine of the Trinity won out because Constantine put his vote in with it. He supported it, presiding over this conference, conference and put his influence behind it. So the scriptures describe for us, if we come back to Revelation chapter 12, they describe for us the situation that would take place once this man-child ascended to the heavens. Revelation chapter 12, there would then be persecution of the rest of them. Remember that we described for you the, um, the situation at the beginning of Revelation chapter 12, how that the woman is a composite woman at the beginning. She represents all of Christianity. She represents all those non uh, pagans, the anti-pagan forces, I guess you could call them. And so within that group, there were the brethren who held the truth. 
There were those who were witnesses against it, who perhaps didn't hold all of the truth, but certainly some of it. And then there was the larger majority who were the apostasy, who did not hold the truth, but believed in the immortality of the soul, the kingdom of heaven, or the idea of going up to heaven. Uh, they believed in the Trinity and many other things. And so what happened was, is that when Constantine uh, brought the church, the apostate church, up to power, when the man of sin, as it's described in Thessalonians, ascended into the heavens, then what happened was, those that were left became persecuted. If we look down at verse 13, we find here, when the dragon saw he was cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman that brought forth the man-child. Well, the dragon, being the armed forces of Rome, was harnessed by Constantine and would be used to basically eradicate any people who would be opposing to his form, to his ideas, to that power base that he had established. And so it was that the basis of the persecution for these people would be the testimony that they held. Verse 17 of the same chapter, we read the woman, um, the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. And we've got to think about the narrative that's going on here. The man-child, or the man, as he's called, really, taking the italics out, has ascended to heaven. He is now the man of sin enthroned. And left behind is the woman now. She has not achieved that status. And so this is the remnant of her seed, those who refuse to be part of these things that are left, and they are turned upon, and they are persecuted by these forces. Now it's interesting to see the reasons why they were turned upon and the reasons why they were persecuted. They really catalog for us by Eusebius. A little book he wrote called The History of the Church from Christ to Constantine is very telling when you go through and you say, all right, here was a man who belonged to the Laodicean apostasy. He was part of that whole group that ascended to the heavens with Constantine, probably his right-hand man as far as the bishops of the day went. How did he view those who didn't believe the same things? And what were the issues that these people held that were such anathema to them? Well, it's interesting that they were things like the pre-existence of Christ. He talks about one Berylus, a bishop of Bostra in Arabia, who perverted what he believes is the true doctrine of Christ and tried to bring ideas alien to the faith actually asserting that our Savior and Lord did not pre-exist in his own form of being before he made his home among men and had no divinity of his own, but only by the Father's dwelling in him, which I suppose we could call God manifestation to a degree. And of course, to deal with this problem, a certain individual named Oregon was sent for. Now, we don't have all the details of these people and exactly what they believed and exactly what their ideas were, but we certainly see here that identified as heresy are those who do not believe in the pre-existence of Christ, which, of course, is right in our doctrines to be rejected. And so it was that non-belief in this would call for Oregon to be sent for, and he would be brought in. Now, this is actually just prior to the ascension of, of the, the church to this great power when Oregon was, was doing his work. But his work would be something that would be used by the churches for many years. He was, of course, one of the great church fathers, as they call him. This is who Oregon was. He was a Greek, schooled in Greek thought, peddling himself and his skill in argument. In his life, he behaved like a Christian, defying the law. He was celibate one of the first of the celibate Christians, basically, who sort of began a little bit of a cult following in that regards. In his metaphysical and theological ideas, he played the Greek, giving a Greek twist to foreign tales. He made use of the books of Chiron, the Stoic, and Cornutus, who taught him the allegorical method of interpreting Greek mysteries, a method that he turned around and applied to the Jewish scriptures. Well, what does all that gobbledygook mean? It means that this man was one of the wise of this world. He was one of the great philosophers of the day. He was a man that had more MADs behind his name than any of us could shake a stick at. He was schooled in Greek thought, 
And he used that university education he had to apply to using the scriptures and consequently came up with what is called the allegorical method of interpreting the, uh, the scriptures. And we'll see how that comes up over and over again. The wisdom of this world, of course, we know is foolishness with God. Well, what else was it that these heretics believed? Because it wasn't just the Trinity. There were a few other things that, you know, were, were major things that they were sort of being led off with, like believing in the resurrection. A new group appeared on the Arabian scene, originators of a doctrine far removed from the truth, namely that the end of our life here as human, or the end of our life here, the human soul dies for a long time with our bodies and perishes with them, the mortality of man. Later, when one day the resurrection comes, it returns with them to life. Again, that would be a heresy for which you would be chased out of the empire of Constantine. Belief in the kingdom of God on earth, a future one that is, not looking at the church as being the kingdom. One Nepos, an Egyptian, taught that the promises made to the saints in the Holy Scriptures would be fulfilled more in accordance with Jewish ideas and suggested that there would be a millennium of bodily indulgence on the earth. In other words, physically, people would be on the earth to enjoy the millennium. Thinking that he could draw on the revelation of John, of all things, to prove this peculiar notion, he wrote a book on the subject proving incontrovertibly that Christ's kingdom will be on earth. They shall live and reign as priests for a thousand years, no doubt is one of the things he quoted. But here is somebody who believes in the kingdom of God on earth for the millennium. He would be a heretic. He would be one that was to be chased out of the empire of Constantine once enthroned in the heavens. This idea of the millennium, not just the kingdom, but the full thousand year reign of Christ. A guy named Papias, goes on to say that he says that after the resurrection of the dead, there will be a period of thousand years when Christ's kingdom will be set up on earth in material form. I suppose he got these notions by misinterpreting the apostolic accounts and failing to grasp what they had said in mystic and symbolic language, which would be Oregon's allegorical way of interpreting the scriptures. Because they weren't using Greek thought, to apply to the scriptures. They couldn't understand that there wasn't literally going to be a kingdom of God on earth and a millennium for a thousand years, but rather that the kingdom was the church and that the whole idea of, of the reward was to go up to heaven. And so it was that Constantine would crush the voices of dissent around him. Eusebius writing says, Thus there were lurking places, the lurking places of the heretics, broken upon by the emperor's command, and the savage beasts, which he calls them, that harbored these doctrines, driven to flight. And he goes on to say that there was a law directed that search should be made for their books. And of course, these books were to be burned, and they were to be banished from the empire. And that, brethren and sisters, is the end part of the story of Revelation chapter 12. Our statement of faith and doctrines to be rejected would put us right in the same circumstance as those who would have been chased right out of the empire. We would be those that would be persecuted with them. But of course, the persecution they were to see is much more than anything that we have ever seen as a community. We find in Revelation chapter 13 that the story continues to unfold. We have there the beast of the sea that comes upon the scene. And this, of course, is the Christian Roman Empire which really Constantine inaugurated. The pagan Roman Empire is seen in chapter 12 as the great red dragon. It's a beast representing a kingdom or an empire. And you come to chapter 13, we have the Christian Roman Empire represented as the beast of the sea. It's the next phase. And it was this phase that was to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him to, over all kindreds, tongues, and nations. So as this system developed, this Christian Roman system, beyond Constantine, the persecution went from beyond banishment 
and uh, a few of the, the unkind things, perhaps you could say, in terms of what was to come next that Constantine was to do, into full-fledged persecution and murder, whereas they would eventually be described as being drunk with the blood of the saints. We have a series of slides we're going to run through that are taken from a book that was written in 1685. It's a book that was written by the Anabaptists to describe the history of their community. And some of these are woodcuts that they drew themselves to show and to stand as a testimony of what happened during that time period. I will warn you now that some of them are a little bit graphic in the sense that they show exactly what this system was all about. And brothers and sisters, I think it's important that we realize that, that we do not underestimate what it was capable of, that we do not just simply see it today as kind of a lame duck system that's lost its power and authority and, and therefore is no threat, but that we continue to see it the way it's described in Revelation chapter 17 as being drunk with the blood of the saints, because that's exactly the way that it is. The emperors who followed Constantine continued his policy and expanded upon it. Following him came one Theodosius. During his reign, he decided that crucifixion should no longer be allowed, not because it was gory and it was inhumane, but because it was holy. That's what they did to the Lord, so we could no longer crucify people because that was now something considered to be holy and sacred. So instead, they had to basically uh, put people to death by what other, other means they could come up with. So Theodosius, in the year 413, put forward some decrees. And he says, If information is obtained that anyone has been re or has rebaptized a servant of the Catholic religion, the universal church, he shall be put to death together with the latter, the one who he baptized, who has committed a punishable crime providing he is of age and admitting of the uh, capability. And so that's the decree of Theodosius, to rebaptize, to have somebody who came to a better understanding and consequently no longer to be sprinkled, but to simply be fully immersed again into an understanding of belief. These people were to be taken and savagely put to death. Well, as we follow this story through, and we're not doing a, a complete kind of following through of the historical events, just trying to pick up on the character in this way, this time through. We find that Daniel had saw that little horn that spoke great things, and of course it came into effect fully during the reign of Emperor Phocas, when Boniface III, who would be the future Pope of Rome, at this point in time he was simply a, a papal a bishop that would go to uh, Phocas, who was prince over the Byzantine Empire. You remember this is while the Byzantine Empire was still in effect. The emperors in the western side really had been done away with. And so it was at this point in time that the papacy looked for its direction from the emperors in the east. They had yet to sort of be established themselves fully independently, that is. And so it was that they obtained from Phocas a decree that the apostolic throne of the blessed apostle Peter should be the head of all the churches. And he goes on to basically say that she herself was first of all churches. And so it was that the church of Rome became supreme. And being supreme, it would use this to its benefit. We're sort of during the period of the fourth trumpet, just to kind of get a, a timeline as to the rest of the book of Revelation, what's going on. And it was the fourth trumpet that would sound, and the third part of the sun would be smitten, the third part of the moon and the third part of the stars. This would be the Western Roman Empire that would be plunged into darkness. It was a transition time in the power of the empire. There would be a change in players that would take place. Now, it was during this fourth trumpet time period that the empire was eclipsed that there would be many barbarian nations that would come to fulfill the, the, the judgments of the trumpets. These would be the Huns and the Goths and the Visigoths and Ostrogoths and all those other Goths as they came in and they basically settled themselves throughout Europe, the Vandals in North Africa. And the interesting thing is that they were, many of them, Christian because they had been Christianized by those who had been banished. 
So all the Christians that had been sent out to the corners of the world, depicted in Revelation 12 as the wings of the empire, took their Aryan non-Trinitarian views, or other than that, out with them. So when these hordes came in, not all of them were Christian, but many of them were, they brought in a mix of ideas that were certainly, again, somewhat pagan and apostate, but they were non-Trinitarian ideas. One of these groups was the Lombards, the long beards that settled in Italy. And they were regarded by the papacy as arch heretics, absolutely wanted nothing to do with them. They, of course, put down the power and the authority of the ruling powers in Rome and established themselves as head of that area for a short period of time. And it would be during this time period, towards the end of the, uh, the I guess you could say, the epoch of these these trumpet soundings that were going on in the West, that along on the scene comes this other creature, the beast of the earth, and this is Revelation chapter 13. Verses 11 to 12, he beheld another beast coming out of the earth that had two horns like a lamb, but it spake as a dragon, and he exercised all the power, which is the same word we looked at earlier, of the first beast before him. So it's like a lamb, meaning Christian, but it speaks as a dragon, meaning Roman. So this is the holy, or Christian, Roman Empire that would come upon the earth, a persecuting system with a Christian veneer. And so it was that Charlemagne, the son of Pepin, would be the, the real first of these emperors, the son of the church, who would go into the area of Italy, would rout the Lombards and many other pagans uh, those barbarians still on the outskirts, and would establish the Holy Roman Empire. But it's interesting the way this man operated as the son of the Catholic Church, because you realize that his characteristic, his method of operation, would be adopted by many others. And that was forced conversions. Charlemagne's struggle with the pagan Saxons, whose greatest leader was Widdicund, lasted from 772 to 804. By dint of forced conversions, wholesale massacres, and transportation of thousands of Saxons into the interior of the Frankish kingdom, Charlemagne made his dominion over Saxony complete. So what he did was basically either convert them, destroy them, or remove them. And that was the policy that he followed. And so was established by this policy the Holy Roman Empire. The trumpet judgments had had no effect on this system. They had not changed it in its method of operation. The Bible tells us in Revelation chapter 9 and verse 21 that they repented not of their murders, of their sorceries, their fornications, nor of their thefts. And so it was during the period of the Holy Roman Empire that the, perhaps the most barbaric of all persecutions would take place the burnings at the stake of people who held belief similar to you and I if they were caught to be taken, to tie to ladders and thrown into the flames. Men and women put to death because of their beliefs. It's perhaps hard for us to comprehend really that this could really take place in this way. The effort of these brethren and sisters is remarkable. The lengths they went to to meet. We meet in relative freedom the way they met was out in boats so that nobody could hear them in the middle of lakes, conducting their Bible classes with lanterns late at night or early in the morning. They also would have to travel long distances. This is a section from a book called Israel and the Alps, a history of the Waldenses, um, written in the 1850s. The writer says entire families traveled great distances to be present. They left their home in the evening and traveled all night. At the outskirts of the villages, the men took off their shoes and walked barefoot along the silent street, lest the clatter of the iron-shod shoes should betray their passing. The feet of the beasts, the donkeys and horses that carried their families, their wives and children, were wrapped in cloths to prevent noise being made. And so it was, that's how they got to the memorial meeting. And we think, brothers and sisters, how much effort do we put into getting to the meeting? Would we travel all night on foot 
risking life and limb, not just for ourselves, but for our families. It's really a stark difference, isn't it, that we travel in air-conditioned cars, in comfy seats, controlled temperatures, not really putting our feet on the ground, propelled by engines and little rubber tires with suspension so that those little bumps don't bother our fragile little bodies. I mean, you compare it to this method of transportation, skulking through the night with bare feet so that you're not caught and put to death. And we really ask, you know, how is it that we can sometimes even claim fellowship with people of this stamp? What kind of effort do we put in to get to the meetings? Or do we? Do we not go sometimes? Do we miss the classes because we have other things more important in our daily routine to do? What is it that drags us away from the meetings that these people would risk their lives to go to. What will kill us, brethren and sisters, as a community is apathy, as this writer will later point out to us. Revelation chapter 13 and verse 15 describes what would become of this group of people during the time of the Inquisition. He had power to cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. We're not going to get into the whole section on the mark of the beast. Suffice it to say that there are two marks in the book of Revelation. There is the seal of God in the forehead of the believer, which is the word of God in mind and heart and soul. And there is the mark of the beast in the forehead of the worshiper of the beast, which is the teachings and doctrines of the church is on their minds and in their hearts. And it's one of those two things. And it would be that those who didn't carry the teachings of the beast in their mind that they were the ones that were put to death, that were persecuted, who did not worship the image of the beast. And the goal of the Inquisition was exactly the same, or the method of the Inquisition was exactly the same as that of Constantine. There would be forced conversion. There would be intimidation. There would be torture. There would be expulsion, or there would be execution. They really operated very similarly. Well, to extract the necessary torture, or confession, sorry, torture was used. But there were some legalities. You see, in theory, you couldn't actually have, under papal law at the time of the Inquisition, you couldn't have a forced confession. So what they had to do was force you first and then take you somewhere else where you could confess in freedom. And that's exactly what they would do. The practice, uh, in practice, the accused was tortured until he was ready to confess, which sooner or later he almost inevitably would be. At that point, he was carried into an adjacent room where his confession was heard and transcribed. The confession was then read back to him, and he was formally asked if it was true. If he replied in the affirmative, it was recorded that his confession had been free and spontaneous, without the influence of force or fear and sentencing would follow, which inevitably would be death. Perhaps the most famous of all the Inquisitions is the Spanish Inquisition. Experienced under Ferdinand and Isabella during the reign of these two Catholic monarchs, anyone found who was a non-Catholic was forced to convert, renounce their faith, face death. In fact, there was a decree that we see here. This is the actual decree that began the the Spanish Inquisition. And it was this decree that was written that would basically go into effect and last for some 350 years. And it was that all non-Catholics, Jews, those who refused to buy into the doctrine of the Trinity, who did not have the mark of the beast, the teaching of the beast in their forehead, they were to be taken and were to be destroyed. It's interesting, though, that the year that this came into effect... 1492, by this point in time, every single Jew from Spain was thrown out of the land or killed. So the year Columbus sailed the ocean blue and set off for America was the year that the Inquisition had eradicated the Jews from Spain where they had lived for some 500 years in relative peace with the Muslim uh, powers that had ruled there for so much time. 
Well, the Bible would be taken, their writings would be gathered together, and they would be burned, whether they were Jewish, whether they were Protestant, or they didn't really call them Protestant at this point in time, but they were non-Trinitarian writings. Incidentally, the last recorded Bible burning in Spain was 1957. The Bibles of the British Foreign Bible Society gathered up and torched. We read in Revelation chapter 13, verse 15, he had power to cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And so it was the common mode of death would be the stake. Focusing on er, the Inquisition, on the way it would behave itself and the way it would act, was primarily on doctrinal basis. That was the issue. It was doctrine. That was what they were after. What did these individuals teach? What was it that they set forward? And so this is an uh, a, um, interrogation that took place of a Waldensian and uh, is described for us by um, the same writer that we've been referring to who wrote Israel and the Alps in the 1870s. Come to Mass or you're a dead man, says the priest. The individual replies, Jesus says, if ye believe in me, though ye were dead, ye shall live. Well, kiss the crucifix. My Jesus is not upon that piece of wood, but in heaven from which he shall come to judge the living and the dead. Will you not kiss it? I do not choose to be an idolater. That was the character, brethren and sisters, of the people at this time. They would not worship the wondrous cross. They would not involve themselves in this type of thing. They refused to bow the knee to this system. And this would bring about their deaths. We have to understand that these were not just, you know, the odd individual here and there. Somebody who had no family or perhaps was a single zealot brother that was just kind of off there on his own and kind of being a little bit of a maverick doing his own thing. These were people that had children. They had families, little kids. They had wives, people they loved. The following is a letter that was preserved. It was written in 1555 of a man named Anthony to his wife. And this is what he had to say just prior to his execution. Anne, my beloved sister and my faithful spouse, you well know how we have loved one another. So long as it has pleased the Lord to leave us together, I pray you therefore, he goes on, that you will always be found such as you have been and better if it be possible when I am no more. If your youth is alarmed at the world and poverty, I advise you to marry again with another brother who equally fears the Lord, fears God only in the Lord. Thenceforth think no more of me as your husband, but as the husband of ashes. From this moment we are no longer united, except in the bond of fraternal charity, in which I hope for your prayers so long as I am alive. Trust in God, pray to him, love him, serve him, and he will not forsake you. Our little girl, as well as yourself, will be dear to him, for he is the protector of the widow and the father and the orphans. And this individual was led off to his death, his wife and daughter behind him. That is the fact of what the system did. Many orphans were made at this point in time, and the writer of this book even depicts two of the children of those victims who went to the stake, gathering around the stake after their parents had been burned, gathering together what little ashes they could find so they would have something to bury. Because that was mom and dad. That's what this system did, brethren and sisters. And it wasn't something that was done in a corner. It was done publicly. They wanted maximum effect out of it to ensure the maximum number of spectators, executions, whenever possible, were performed on public holidays. The condemned would be tied to a post above the pyre of dry wood, high enough to the visible assembled crown, crowd. And so that's the way they behaved. Put them up on a, sta on, a, on a platform so everybody can see and the whole town would turn out. 
The barbarity of this system cannot be underestimated. The executioner, writes one eyewitness, came and laid hold of one, having, after having wrapped linen cloth around his head, led him out to the ground adjacent to the building, caused him to fall down upon his knees and cut his throat with a knife. That's the system that we've been talking about. The writer of this book is so disgusted by these things, he basically relates this to human sacrifice. He says, Their trial having been finished, their torches not spared, five of them were condemned to death on the 24th of March, 1510. The execution was reserved for Palm Sunday. Human victims, the offerings of the Church of Rome to its false gods. And quite often, the burning at the stake wouldn't kill somebody. So they would have to finish them off afterwards. We cannot, brethren and sisters, just look away from the system and point the finger elsewhere and say that there is anything that could even closely come to the crimes of the system. They are guilty because of the weight of evidence tallied up in blood against them. The beast of the earth, we read in Revelation 11 verse 7, getting into the time period of the witnesses, when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them. It's during the period just prior to the French Revolution, the time period of the Huguenots, that this great massacre would take place. August the 24th, 1572. It's described for us by one of the survivors. It was determined to exterminate all Protestants and a plan was approved by the Queen. The Duke of Guise who was put in full command of the enterprise, summoned by night several captains of the Catholic Swiss mercenaries from the five little cantons and some commanders of French companies and told them that it was the will of the king that according to God's will they should take vengeance on the band of rebels while they had, their beasts, while they had the beasts in the toils. They had sort of suppressed them for this period of time. Victory was easy and the booty was great and, they obtained, and to be obtained without danger. The signal to commence the massacre should be given by the bell of the palace and the marks by which they should reckon each, recognize each other in the darkness was a bit of white linen tied around the left arm and a white cross on the hat which would of course sit upon the forehead. That's the system that would take a whole generation of people and wipe them out in Rome. In fact, have you ever heard of Rollin's ancient history that Brother Thomas makes reference to? Rollin was a Huguenot who lived in the 1700s following these things. And he was one of the few survivors, or his family, that left us, were left to sort of tell about it. Revelation chapter 11 verse 10 says that they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and send gifts one to another. It became a national holiday. And in fact, they even struck a medal that's depicted here. It's seen in Eureka in somewhat of a line drawing, but we managed to find an actual picture of the medal itself. Victory of the Catholic Church, the woman here, with the cross in her hand and sword in the other, over the heretics, the Huguenots. And brethren and sisters... This wasn't just men and women. This was men, women, children, and babies in one day. Tens of thousands of them massacred all throughout Paris. So the words of Revelation 16 and verse 16, they have shed the blood of the saints and prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. That's verse 6, sorry. So when the vile judgments of Napoleon and the others that were used would come upon the system, it was a true and righteous judgment of Almighty God to wrest from their hand and take away the temporal power that they would use to persecute those saints for those long period of time. But remember, brothers and sisters, that this current system is depicted as a woman drunk with the blood of the saints, the blood of the martyrs of Jesus Christ, and he says that when he saw her, he wondered with great admiration. The writer of this book that we've been referencing, and it's, it's rather a thick book, there's several volumes to it. In fact, I read about, I'm going to say maybe three quarters of the first volume, but it just sort of goes on and on and on and on describing this massacre and that massacre and all the different things that took place. And you begin to realize how terrible these things were. What these people were dragged together 
and burned at the stake for was simply for refusing to admit that the little cookie, the death cookie, the Eucharist, was in fact the body and blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. They said, we cannot agree with that, taken out and burned at the stake. They refused to bow down to the cross, to worship and kiss the crucifix, taken out and burned at the stake. You could pretty well go through our doctrines to be rejected and for every single one taken out and burned at the stake. And so it is the writer, though not a Christadelphian, a Protestant of a sort, not holding the truth by any means to the same extent that we would see it, has this to say. Our indignation is roused against the authors of such atrocities when we are ready to declare that the Church of Rome should be called the Church of Devils. Pagans, barbarians, and savages could not act so cruelly. It was left for popery to degrade men beneath the level of beasts. A man is burned alive. It is a terrible, laconic expression. How much pain and suffering does it describe? Can we fail to recognize in persecuting Rome the great whore of the apocalypse, drunk with the blood of the saints and the martyrs, the abominable city in which was found the blood of all those that have been slain? And that's his sentiment, brethren and sisters. It's the same sentiment as Brother Roberts, who writing in the 13 lectures says, Can we not see a correspondence to the symbols of the book of Revelation, a Roman system that says has enthroned among them or sustained among them an ecclesiastical system enthroned on seven hills historically reeking with the blood of heretics everyone knows that this is just the situation of affairs and so it is brothers and sisters that we really have to ask do we need to look anywhere else to be able to identify the system as we go through those prophecies, and we haven't really followed through all the story of it, just simply highlighted the parts that talk about her resume of crime. When we go through all those things, we recognize that there is no system on the face of the earth that could possibly be identified with all the crime over all the periods of time that could be so full of such religious bloodshed in all of history. This system is supreme in this over thousands of years. The same author of this book, who recorded the tragedy of the history of the Waldensian and Paulican peoples in the valley of the Piedmontese, he went back there when writing his book and doing his research. And he says, you know, the interesting thing is that there is no persecution anymore in the 1850s. Of course, Napoleon had come along by that point in time. They had been removed from their temporal power, hadn't they? And he says, at the present day, Protestantism flourishes again on the desolate slopes of Leberon. But religious indifference has wrought greater ravages among the souls than the persecution of former times. The inhabitants of these regions scarcely even know their history. And that, of course, is the danger of apathy. Do we know our history, brethren and sisters? Do we know what manner of people we ought to be? Do we know of those that have gone before who have risked their very lives and spent their very lives for the things that we have? People like Tyndale burned at the stake for translating the Bible into English so that you and I can have it upon our laps to read. Do we recognize our history? Do we treasure the truth that we have? The freedom to come together and worship on a Wednesday night or a Sunday night or a Sunday morning or at a Bible school like this? Or is that freedom more of an inconvenience because we have other things more important that we have to do? This is the testimony of the apocalypse. These are the people who are called our fellow servants. Are we worthy to even be numbered with them? We really have to look at our lives and say if we want to be with the Lord Jesus Christ in the latter days then we have to identify with this system. He goes on to say in our own day we see so much religious indifference prevailing amongst the religious communities not only enjoying freedom but loaded with gifts addressed with invitations rather than threats surrounded with encouragements instead of obstacles. 
we see scriptural faith and life extinguished before the breath of selfishness and corruption by the mere power of the infirmities of our nature. That is what we fight more than anything today. Now he's writing in the 1850s. How much more so today, brethren and sisters? It's a battle for our mind, as we looked at with the first century, isn't it? A battle for our affections. A battle for our hearts. To serve the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our mind, and with all our soul. Well, the system has not changed. Do not be deceived, brethren and sisters. Given any slightest opportunity to gain power back, and it will seize upon it. Back in the Second World War, during the period of Nazi occupation of Europe, there was a little group down in an area called Croatia at the time. And this group were the Ostashi. Now, the Ostashi were a group of um, Croatian Catholics who had lived with their Serbian Orthodox neighbors and Muslims as well for many years. You see, Yugoslavia, as it was called, or Croatia, Bosnia, is kind of that part of the three heavens, I guess you could say. They all come a third part of the earth. They all join right here. You have the western, I guess I should do it this way, the western Latin part, you have the eastern Orthodox part, and you have the southern Muslim part. And they all meet in this little area of Bosnia, and that's why all the, the wars are going on over there. They're religious wars. That's what they are. People call it ethnic cleansing. cleansing. Ethnic's got nothing to do with it. It's religious cleansing. That's what it's about. Catholicism versus uh, the, the Muslims, or versus the, the Yugoslavian Orthodox Serbs. And it was that during the Second World War, that the Nazis, as they went through, they came across this group in Croatia. And the Gestapo, who were the shock troops of the, of the, uh, the Nazi operations in Europe, they were the ones responsible for the final solution, the SS. The SS's officers remarked how barbaric this little group of Astashis were. And they were led by a man named Stepanik, or Stepanuts, as they call him over there. He was an archbishop a Roman Catholic archbishop. And he was the spiritual leader, along with Ante Pavelic, who was the, I guess you could say, temporal leader. He was the one that would rule over the country itself. And they came up with a policy, interesting little policy, of convert a third, expel a third, and massacre a third, going right back to the time of Charlemagne. We're either going to convert you over to Roman Catholicism, which is what is depicted here, or we are going to throw you right out of the land altogether, or we are just going to butcher you on sight. 700,000 individuals in that little area lost their lives in a few short years to this policy. Whole books have been written about it. And so it was that when Marshal Tito came along with the communists, when he sort of put the lid on this and he stopped it all, that when he died, out came all these parties. Again, in fact, it was the Americans at the time that were trying to help them out and install democracy over in that area of Yugoslavia. And so what they said was, well, listen, true democracy, you can't outrule parties. You have to be true. Tito would not allow any nationalistic or religious parties, atheistic communism anyway. But what they ended up doing was the Americans came in and said, well, we really should have um, freedom to have as many parties as you want. And so within three weeks, the whole country was divided into Catholic, Eastern Orthodox, and Muslim. And the war began that we've been watching, really, for the last ten years. That's what it was all about, religion. And those Serbs who, back at the time of the Second World War, lost some 700,000 of their countrymen had the upper hand for a short period of time and tried to execute some justice and judgment on this people. And of course, they went the other way as well. But these aren't things that just sort of go back to the 1940s. Just a couple of years ago, in the 1990s in Rwanda, there was a war going on there between the Hutus and the Tutsis. And of course, it doesn't get a whole lot of play, but it was largely a religious war between a Catholic 
and a non-Catholic group. This is the testimony of somebody at one of the trials. goes on to say this. This young woman says, We sought refuge in the garage and closed, the barricaded, uh, closed and barricaded the doors. Outside, a bloodbath was going on. Suddenly, an orphan began to weep as it got hot in the garage. At once, the killers approached the garage. As the refugees refused to come out, the militia leader decided to burn them alive in the garage. The nuns are coming to help us. They are bringing gasoline, I heard their leader say. Looking through a hole that the militiamen meanwhile had made in the wall, I indeed saw Sister Gertrude and Sister Kistro, Kisitro. The latter was carrying a petrol can. Shortly after that, the garage was on fire. That is the system of things that once given just that slightest little ability to raise itself again, will butcher because it is drunk with the blood of all those who would oppose it. The saints, the believers, and also the martyrs, those who protest against it. And just in case, brothers and sisters, we have any difficulty in identifying this system as the persecuting power that it is, in Ignatius Loyola's church in Rome, where he is buried, they have done us the favor of depicting there the Roman Catholic Church as a woman. In her hand, of course, she has a cross, and she is treading underfoot the heretics. And down here is a lovely little cherub with a Bible ripping the pages out of it. That is the Catholic Church that the Bible speaks about. It goes on to say, as we will look at later on, true and righteous are his judgments, for he hath judged the great whore and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. Let's not, brothers and sisters, be asleep. Let's not get involved with the system in any way, not be drunk with the wine of its doctrines, not be involved in its ecumenical reaches, because as one modern Protestant writer, and there's very few of them left, has written for us, he says this, Christians today are like little blades of grass, growing up in the sunshine, and there's a big lawnmower coming toward them, and it's singing hymns. It's the Roman Catholic Church.